Hey guys, welcome to the Booster Pack. My name is Rance, and this is the show where we unwrap the stories and crack the mysteries of collectible game history. And today on the show, we are going to do that with one very special collectible card game. But before we do, let me introduce our guest. So, simply put, our guest today is a fan, is a gamer, and he is an entrepreneur. And it was in the mid-90s, just when the Western world was waking up to the wonders of Japanese animation, that he took all three of those qualities and launched his career in the hobby gaming industry. So here's what happened. Just as pop culture in the West, he was brimming with brand new anime titles, he knows that this left a gap in the role-playing game market. So what he did is he embarked on a journey to fill it with an anime-centric, multi-genre role-playing game. The world's first. That was the origin-nominated Big Eyes Small Mouth role-playing game. Besom, for short. And the commercial success and critical acclaim of that allowed him to later make several role-playing games based on some of the hottest anime franchises of the time. Things like Trigun, Tenchi Mio, Helsing, just to name a few. However, none would be more iconic than the very first licensed anime role-playing game he wrote, the Sailor Moon RPG. And that's where we come in, because with that license, he ended up creating one of the world's first female-laid collectible games, the Sailor Moon CCG. And as if all that wasn't <laughs> impressive enough, he has a whole slew of more recent successes to talk about. We'll get to those later. Well, without any further ado, allow me to introduce our guest today. That is the guest who is bringing a lot of firsts to the Booster Pack today. He is the first elected official we've ever had. He is the first slam poet we've ever had. And perhaps most importantly, he is the first ever Canadian we've had on the show. Welcome to the show, the president of Discami Publishing, Mark McKinnon. Mark, how are you? Hey, Ranza, it's great. Thanks very much for having me on. And uh, yeah, I can say you did your research on that. That was, that was pretty great. Yeah, that's right. We like to start this the show high energy and we like to give people a bit of a background. So let's jump into your background. Let's go way back. Like uh, what got you interested in hobby games? Like what was the first little thing that you sort of latched onto that brought you to the industry eventually? Yeah, that was, uh, you know, my friend in grade seven getting for Christmas, the, uh, the red box set, the basic set for D&D. &D, and we popped it out. And it just opened up a world that I had never dreamed of before. Uh, every day we would just uh, race back to our houses. We'd create these dungeons and, and, and having these people and we'd get together and then we'd fight it out. We were playing it completely wrong, but it was the first introduction and that started everything. Uh, then later on in high school, actually getting in with a gaming group and people that were more experienced, that is what set me on the path of role-playing just just provided so much value to my life going forward. And so much of what I am now is because of role playing and, and what that gave to me. That's fantastic. Well, let's start there. Like you obviously found your way from an uh, into the industry, but not everybody goes from opening a red box of Dungeons and Dragons all the way to becoming a publisher of some of the most loved RPGs of all time. How do you bridge that gap? Well, a lot of it just comes from, from being a fan and then taking a bit of a chance. So I was at the University of Guelph. I was doing uh, my chemistry degree and I finished my undergraduate degree and I was working on my master's degree at the time. And I was heavily into role playing, specifically the Amber Diceless role playing system. That was that was the thing that I moved on to, highly, highly narrative, and got in with the publisher, Eric Wujic of Phage Press, and got to know him and started a convention for AmberCon. And it was... Uh, a real great way to get introduced to the industry, but it was specifically the big ice small mouth, how that came about creating was had an opportunity to binge watch the first season of Ronma one half unexpectedly uh, that I had not seen before. And, you know, I obviously I grew up with Astro Boy and Battle of the Planets and a lot of those, those classics, but it was Ronma one half specifically when I watched that first season, I thought, I have to role play this. This is going to be great. My friends are going to love it. We have to get together and do this. And I didn't think there was anything on the market that I found that really kind of did what I wanted to do. And I thought, well, I'll just create my own system. I'm, I'm familiar with Amber and d and I'm going to create this rules light system. And it's going to be the Amber role play or the, uh, the Ronma role playing game. And we'll just play it with, with friends. But then as I got writing it and moving through it, 
I realized that you know, if I just expand this out a little bit further, I can go beyond, you know, the anything goes martial arts of Ranma and half, and I can go into any anime genre, any anime setting by just expanding the rules to the set a little bit. And so that's what I did. Um, I took out a, a small business loan that the Canadian government offered because I was a, again, a student at the time doing my master's degree in uh, chemistry and published a thousand copies that I went to origins. I was working as a, actually in the demo team market for Chameleon Eclectic at the time, which did the Babylon 5 role-playing game. So I showed up to demo games from them. And because I was going, I brought, you know, my copies of the the Bessem RPG, the first edition, Big Eyes, Small Mouth, before it was actually called Bessem, it was Big Eyes, Small Mouth, and uh, partnered up with the Game Publishers Association to sell that at Origins and Gen Con for the first time, expecting my thousand copies that I printed with uh, the loan from the Canadian government would last me my lifetime, but it sold out in a couple of months. Uh, in the end, it was a big hit of Origins and uh, Gen Con for a small press publisher. We weren't obviously D&D level, but it was the, the first game that I did. And that gave me the opportunity to launch forward based on the success of that. There was this demand for these type of really rules light anime role playing game, I guess, that I, I didn't know that I was creating or fulfilling a need. I, I did, had no clue. I know what I wanted. And I was creating something for myself and my gaming group. Turns out there's a lot of other people like me. And so that's uh, how it got started. And that's what got nominated for the Origins Award, uh, which kind of gave me an idea that maybe I should maybe have a bit of a future in this. That's fantastic. So there's a couple of things to pull out there. First of all, obviously, um, you, much like, you know, your role-playing friends were fans of anime and fans of role-playing. So you, you, uh, there was this subculture at the time that anime was sort of this underground thing and you serviced that same crowd that was also the same underground crowd that was playing things like Dungeons and Dragons. The other thing I really wanted to pull out there is it sounds like there was two significant moments there where you opened something and it opened a whole new world to you. The Dungeons and Dragons set and the Ramna one half watching it. It was like opening a whole new world and you inspired you obviously to create worlds that other people could open and share that that is two feelings all in one. Yeah, and a lot, a lot of it was, it was just stumbling through, you know, I would say convenient mistake to convenient mistake. I mean, I, I had no background <laughs> in business. That, that, that wasn't what my focus was. I didn't want to be a game publisher. I wanted to be a chemist. That was, I'm a, very much a scientist, and that was my focus. But opportunities ended up unfolding, and that ended up leading eventually into to Sailor Moon from best zone, uh, which was which was the probably the, the most fortuitous mistake that gave us the most amount of opportunities from there. That's amazing. So obviously you started a company called uh, Guardians of Order. Um, and that then after Bessem, you pursued uh, licenses for actual uh, anime series that were contemporary at the time. Obviously, things like Sailor Moon, which was starting to air in, in Canada very popularly and then eventually in the US as well, even more so. So how do you end up getting a license like Sailor Moon uh, going from, you know, uh, almost self-published work to get, getting what would become one of the biggest anime licenses of the 1990s? Yeah, and it was complete luck. Uh, so while I was obviously into anime, I was much more traditional guys anime, the shonen type. Uh, you know, I, I always had a a fairly diverse perspective, but Sailor Moon was not on my radar. It was my girlfriend at the time uh, who said, oh, you should watch a Sailor Moon show with me. I was like, oh, whatever. You know, it's a bunch of girls running around in short skirts. It seems a little, uh, it, it wasn't really my show, but I started watching it. I was like, oh, go, this is really good. It has so much uh, characterization, which as a role player, it was never about the the fighting and and the, the slaying and the killing things and taking their stuff. It was always about the characters and the characterizations in Sailor Moon were, were great. Uh, so she encouraged me to watch it. And when I watched it, I was like, oh, this, this is pretty neat. I wonder what it would take. Maybe I can do a role playing game on this. I don't know how, how it would get done. I have no clue. I said, I'm just going to look on the internet, which back in you know, 1996, 97, the, the internet was not what it was today. So I just happened to stumble across this, this phone number for, uh, sound like an agent. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll give them a call. And so I called up this company uh, down in the States and I said, hey, I'm just interested in Sailor Moon role-playing game license. He's like, what's a role-playing game? I was like, well, you know, it's kind of like Dungeons and Dragons, but it's a game. It's like a, you play at a table. He's like, so it's a board game. I was like, well, it's kind of like a board game. He says, well, actually, interesting story. Last week, the company that had the Sailor Moon board game license went out of business. And so it's available. Do you want it? I was like, uh, 
sure, <laughs> I, I'll take it. Uh, you know, I, I'll have some money. And so I, I ended up getting it because of that. They knew nothing about me. I knew nothing about them. I didn't know anything about anything at the time. And it was just the fortuitous nature of one week earlier the company went out of business that actually had the license previously. And so that license was with Deke uh, that I ended up getting, which was the North American company that published Sailor Moon at the time from Japan. And that relationship with Deke turned into the role-playing game. But interesting enough, whenever they actually got to see what my game was, they said they actually couldn't license it because it was a book. And books are in a different category in Japan when it comes to licensing. So games are the anime side, books are the manga side. So I had to, they transferred over my license to Kodansha in Japan. And I, I had to work directly with them on that, which was interesting because later on when I did some, the Sailor Moon Button Men and I worked with Dark Flip Cards to do the Sailor Moon CCG, that was with Deke down in the States, but Kodansha was the one that had to do the role-playing game. So it was, it was really just luck how I stumbled into it. But once I was in and I realized the power of anime licenses, that's when I started reaching out to other companies, Pioneer and uh, Anoki Films, AD Vision, and a lot of the, the localized American arms or the American sub-licensers from the Japanese companies. And that's how we ended up getting a lot of licenses for role-playing games at the time. That's amazing. To put it in uh, role-playing game terms, some that you're familiar with, obviously you're just rolling like crits the whole time, just 20, 20, 20. I did. Uh, I, I really did. That's amazing. Like, I am so envious of that story. So pe so many people fail upwards from being, you know, not that being a chemist is bad or anything like that, but fail into working on some of their favorite properties in one of their favorite genres of all time. That's just taking those chances and rolling that luck. Fantastic. I love it. And it's it's a great little RPG story as well, you know? Um, okay, so we don't have too much time. So I do jump, want to jump forward a little bit. The Sailor Moon RPG comes out and it's a hugely successful thing. As we spoke about, you know, there was an underground culture that loved D&D. &D, there was an underground culture that loved anime and it was a perfect Venn diagram. So it was a super success. And then there was a bunch of other books you did as well that I would, I have so many questions about, but we ain't going to get to today, unfortunately. Um, tell me about where the inkling for the collectible version of a Sailor Moon game come from. Give me as much detail as possible. Yeah, so when we were doing the, the Sailor Moon role-playing game, we obviously had to stat out all the monsters and all the characters. And, you know, the role-playing game is fairly involved in what it was. And we were going to some local conventions in Canada, and we went to one where we ended up meeting uh, Dark Flip Cards. Dark Flip Cards was from Montreal, and they had the Sailor Moon license for cards. So they did a lot of trading cards at the time. That Primarily, that's what they did. But because they had the card license, the collectible card game license was also included in that. And they know that we did the role-playing game. And so uh, Dino, the, the one of the, the owners of Dark Flip Cards, approached me at a con and we talked. And it's like, hey, do you, do you want to do this design for us? Uh, and I thought, well, that that should be pretty interesting. I've never designed a collectible card game, but you know, I know game design at the time, and it was heavily based on what all the all the design work and the numbers and the the oppositions I knew worked because we did it with the role playing game. So if Sailor Mercury runs into Bamboo, the the Negaverse villain, and they have a battle, I know how it played out, and we had the numbers to to back that up. And so what we did is we translated all the role playing game numbers into the collectible card game numbers, taking inspiration from other games that were out there. And Pokemon was one of the larger inspirations because it was something that was geared at a little bit younger age. But one of the things, uh, the kind of key design elements whenever I was creating a Sailor Moon collectible card game, unlike most card games out there where you're fighting an opponent, I specifically, I, I didn't want one person playing the Sailor Scouts and one person playing the monsters. That didn't seem right. So I wanted everyone playing the heroes. And so how are you going to fight the villains? And so I came up with the idea that you're playing down heroes and villains, and the villains you play are for the other people to fight. And so it was that idea that it was not cooperative. You weren't on the same team. It was an oppositional game, but I wasn't fighting against you. I was fighting against the monsters you put out. And that was a key element that I think in some ways took away some of the uh, the confrontation of the game that were very common in collectible card games, which opened the market to a younger girls market where maybe it wasn't as inviting. I mean, obviously, the license was very inviting to younger girls, but I think uh, the less confrontational as well was it wasn't about friendship. It wasn't that type of game, but it wasn't the I'm attacking you. And that I think was much more accessible, which is why I think it, it did as well as it did. Well, I just want to stop there obviously because there is a few things in the design i wanted to ask about obviously you mentioned that both players were playing simultaneously the scouts 
and the monsters and the villains in two different rows. And I think you're completely right. I think that made it a little bit more accessible because it took, you, you had to attack with your scouts to get damage back from the monsters. So, you know, if, you know, young girl or something like that didn't want to hurt her Sailor Mercury or didn't want her Sailor Mercury to go, she wouldn't put her out there or put her in that vulnerable position, right? Um, I think that was a, a really intuitive thing. Like it, it really sort of surprised me. And if you looked, I wanted to ask you about where that origin of that, that idea came from, because as a, a collectible game historian of sorts, it seems like, and I think I can trace it back, at least in the English collectible games, the first game where good guys and bad guys were mixed together in the same deck. Um, and you just came with up, up with that by yourself? Yeah, that was that was a design that I think was was partially based on Pokemon. Not that it wasn't directly there, but the the bench style of Pokemon, where you're swapping in and out, almost like wrestling tag teams. I was a huge wrestling fan, and the idea of having uh, a team, of course, in Sailor Moon made sense. But it was the nature of how do we, you know, Sailor Moon is all about good guys fighting bad guys. And no one wants to be the bad guy. How do we do it? And the only way to do it was to have you playing out bad guys for other people to fight. You couldn't play down your own villains and fight your own people because then you'd always play the, the weakest ones. But you want to play out the, the toughest, most strategic villains to make it very difficult for your opponents to defeat them. And that was, it just came from a lot of it was, was knowing the series inside and out, being very intimate with the license, uh, and then the role-playing game. And from there, that's we, uh, how I came up with the design for that. I mean, I wasn't just completely in isolation. I did have my my whole team at Guardians of Order working on it, but I was the, the primary lead designer that came up with that concept. Well, that's really fascinating because it's something that, say, there was a contemporary of the Sailor Moon card game, um, uh, Decipher, who was doing things like the Star Wars trading card game and stuff like that, where it would intentionally split good guys and bad guys, light side, Jedis and Sith in the bad decks. And you would have to bring it to a tournament, uh, both decks if you wanted to play competitively, because you know if you came across somebody who was playing light side, you had to play dark side, blah, blah, blah. It caused so many headaches. And I, you know, just from what I can observe, it seems like they took inspiration for their next game, which came out following Sailor Moon to solve that issue with the Lord of the Rings trading card game where you, they did something similar. You were playing the Fellowship at the same time you were playing Orcs and all that sort of stuff. So I really feel like you broke through this sort of ceiling that sort of had stopped certain licensed games from coming into fruition at that time. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it might've been, I, I'm not a, a, a card gamer. I mean, I don't play a lot of CCGs, I never did. I approached the CCG design from a role-playing background and that was my my approach to it. So some of the traditional role uh, CCG choices for those game designs, I probably didn't know about them. That wasn't the my kind of angle. If other people took any kind of inspiration, I, th I think that's great, that's, that's wonderful, obviously. And maybe because it was a fairly unique approach at the time, is why it was was well received even if it was non-traditional because i didn't know magic inside and out and i didn't know vampire um whatever the card game was that oh very eternal struggle yeah turtle struggle so i just didn't play them a lot uh, pokemon i i played a lot to understand how a bench type system could work where you have multiple characters out there and uh yeah so it's, it's interesting that you mentioned other games came later that might have taken some inspiration because i don't play a lot of card games like that yeah for sure and there was um i actually revisited this week with my partner both of us big sailor moon fans um and something we hadn't really done for you know at least almost 20 years we'll say um and there was a lot of refreshingness to the casual play style in it. Like you didn't, unlike Magic or Pokemon, didn't limit the amount of cards you could play once per turn. Like that almost seems like a storytelling thing. It's like, if I have these cards, why would I stop you playing them? Put them down. Yeah, that, and that, that was the key element. There was a, a lot had, had to do with, with fun. And fun is, the fun part is playing, right? Playing the cards, not, not trying to strategize how best to keep cards in the future and how you're going to maybe build an engine and play it later it's you got cards you want to get them out there and maybe you don't want to play every card of course because strategy does play a factor but that was definitely a decision of not to take that uh, kind of action economics and remove that from the game and make it all about getting things out into play so you can start having those adventures in fact i have a, a a rule that was penalizing players that didn't play monsters out. If you didn't play enough monsters for your opponents to fight, they got bonuses and they got points to win because they didn't have anyone to fight. And so you had to make sure that you got your monsters out so that there's uh, opposition for other people. And a lot of that did come from the, the narrative aspect is what kind of Sailor Moon episode would it be if you show up to fight and, and Sailor Mercury has no monsters to fight. So that was, that was very purposeful choices, but I think it was because of the strong role playing background that I had. Well, uh, you know, what's a monster of a week show without any monsters, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs>
Um, okay, so I just wanted to point out a couple of things there. So first of all, uh, you mentioned that fun was a key component to what you wanted to achieve. And I honestly think, sitting back, I play a lot of collectible games. I had a lot of fun playing this game this week. I just basically mm. shuffled up some starter decks and they were played them out of the box and they were really fun. Um, the thing I really wanted to say that I thought was so much fun um, was, and I want to ask where it came from, where did what the game calls Gen Ken Pon or oh. rock, paper, scissors come from to settle disputes. Like Pokemon has coin yeah. flipping right. and magic uh, has like dice rolling sometimes and stuff like that. Where did that rock, paper, scissors version come from? Yeah, with, with Pokemon had that card, that coin flipping as you, you need some sort of randomized element. And, you know, we obviously use dice in a role playing game. But when it came to, to doing the, the card game, two results, a positive or negative, a, a hedge or tails wasn't enough. I needed that third result. And that's where obviously the rock, paper, scissors came in. I mean, I had was uh, familiar with a lot of role playing and there was rock, paper, scissors in some live action vampire playing where you're, you're doing that at LARPing. And so as, a, as an action mechanism, you don't need any objects. You don't need dice. You don't need a coin. You could just do it with your hands. We, we did end up including cards because it was nice to have the cards in the game. But it was uh, it came from a desire to have randomness without an additional component, but I needed more than, a, than a, a, a binary system. I needed that tertiary. I needed that third option, which is the ties in the Jean Campon. And so that played well. And the reason why I called it Jean Campon instead of rock, paper, scissors was partially just to give that Japanese feel to it. So there is something I want to pull out there. That is something I, like I said, I revisited it for the first time this week in a while. And that element really was the most, not most exciting. There was a lot of exciting things in it, but that really took the game off the table and made it about us playing almost in a live action role-playing game setting. It's like, what am I going to do versus what are you going to do? We hide our hands behind our back and then, you know, play our scissors or paper or whatever. And there was that big ah moment and it kept it that casual feel. It didn't feel that, crunchiness that you feel from other collectible card games you know high-end ones like verse system or magic the gathering or anything like that it, it, it also added that social element uh and interesting enough there's this funny story that uh my, my wife who worked at the company at the time and one of the employees always knew that whenever we played i always chose rock all the time as my as my opener i always chose rock and i didn't realize this and so anytime we played they always beat me every single time and i and i couldn't figure out why i kept losing kept losing they talked about it. they thought it was so funny because they i was very predictable and so i eventually clued in it's like wait a minute they're always choosing paper i figured their strategy out of course the reason why they're doing that is because they figured mine so once i figured out what their strategy was then i can change mine which is one of the reasons why these cards were great because they did remove the social element for those people that did not want to be kind of uh foretold of what they were going to do you could just randomly choose a card whether it's a rock paper scissors and that was specifically because i was very predictable and that's why we included it in the game that's fantastic so in in obviously collectible card games they called like there's a strategic meta game where you're basically trying to figure out what de decks beat which decks. And you're talking about a social metagame that you infused in the game uh, just so that people can sort of work and play that little social, casual, sort of fun sort of way. I thought it was fantastic. And you know what? Speaking of casual play, it did feel like it was tailored towards not only a casual player, but a more serious player. And that was evident in the fact that you built in three separate rule systems. There was a basic rule system, whereas essentially it was just flipping cards off the top of your deck, sort of like an advanced type of war, really to uh, a, a standard rule system, to the advanced rule system where there was me bigger penalties and stuff like that. Where did the inspiration for that come from? Because I don't see that in any other games. Like obviously there's basics like versions of like starter sets and stuff, but not writ through the entire set. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm glad you actually brought that up because it's something that, that rarely gets mentioned. And that did come from wanting to have the biggest diversity with with the most number of people that could possibly play because i had a lot of i knew a lot of kids right and you know four or five year olds who at the time i knew loved pokemon but they couldn't play the pokemon game and so i thought well everyone can flip over cards so if you just flip over a card and kind of like oh who who has the higher number you win as you said it was a version of war that allowed the really young people to play because for me again why i designed this uh yes i was getting paid and so that was a, a motivating factor but it was also i wanted something that people could have those social connections and and I wanted parents to play with their kids or their young 
brothers and sisters or cousins or whatnot. And so I needed to have that secondary level of being very, very simple. And you can just play it on a very service level. But with the role playing game as well, you can play it at different levels uh, in terms of the levels of complexity, optional rules and, and how deep you want to get into it. And so it made sense that if we're having the base level and then here's a simple version, why wouldn't I create also a more advanced version, something a little bit more difficult? So you can choose the level you play at, which may be predicted by your age group or your level of sophistication, and then you can work through the game. So if you can have a game that Sailor Moon that grows with you, that's approachable for young children, that's approachable for parents that have the kids or younger siblings that they want integrated, that was my main focus was because I wasn't the, the business person, that wasn't the drive behind it, it was to create something that connects people. And to this day, that's why I do the games I do is that connections that I, that I just think is so important in gaming. That's so fantastic. Like, obviously, I was a kid when the Pokemon Boom came out, when the Sailor Moon card game came out, and there were so many kids, and I'm sure you ask anybody from my generation, who says, uh, Pokemon cards, yeah, I know, I think there was a game, but they, I just like to put them out and look at them and stuff like that. Whereas just having that printing, that bold pink printing at the bottom that just said basic game was so much more inviting. Like, I just, I really enjoyed it, and revisiting it reminded me of how much I how much I really did enjoy it. And considering you had very little collectible card game experience, I feel like I mean, obviously, in collectible games, there's this thing called development where it's like hard strategy, working out numbers and stuff like that. Sailor Moon card game is a lot more casual. It doesn't have that. My recommendation is if you're going to play it, shuffle up whatever you can find and just play because it'll balance itself in some way. But, you know, when you get to competitive strategies, there's always going to be a hard line thing, especially because you can, there's no like resource system specifically that limits you the way you play. But I was really fascinated by that. Do you remember, just quickly, let's jump back um, to the early days of the design. Was there anything that you wanted to try or anything that didn't make it into the final version or something that you really liked that just you couldn't make work? Uh, no, I, I think everything that we wanted, because it, again, it was really just the the role playing game translated into the collectible card game. It, it translated very well. The biggest issue that we had, and I didn't realize until later was because again, I was not a collectible card game publisher. Uh, so I didn't know about press sheets and number of cards needed and efficiency of packaging. So I created the game that I thought was the right game. You had a, a two player starter deck, and then you also had six individual decks you can get for all the different characters. I created probably the most expensive game to print out there. I, I, I just created the right number of cards for the game and I packaged them the way I wanted to, not having any clue that I was doing it very inefficiently. And I was creating something that for the publisher, Dart Flip Cards, I cost them a lot of money because it wasn't, I didn't efficiently use their press. Uh, what I did is I, I went with something that was better for the game. So that was probably the, the biggest stress point, but it wasn't because of the game. It was because of the lack of knowledge on what the publishing market was. I had published books up to there and, and books are much simpler. Just as long as it's in 16 page signatures, not a problem, but cards are very, very different. And especially when you bring randomization, you have your core decks, which is your fixed, and then you have booster packs with a random uh it was a real mess and for someone that didn't have any experience uh, in the business front it was probably way too expensive to do for for a normal company well it's so interesting you mentioned that because i do recall i think just probably because of the way you did the press sheets the randomization was very predictable like it was very much like if you opened a booster pack the next booster pack would be almost the same or cards or there would be some of those cards and I believe that the fandom noticed that the chase cards were all in one row of the booster box because they were printed on a separate sheet. Do you have any memories of that? Yeah, I mean, I remember it actually happening and seeing people at the booth, uh, you know, looking at the decks and then counting down to get certain ones. That was, I mean, I assumed random meant random. Uh, obviously, the, the company that they used for printing it maybe had a different idea in mind. But yeah, I do remember that was a bit of a flaw that that came that, you know, until the game was out in the wild, we didn't know about it. Okay, well, speaking once it gets out in the wild, what was the feedback that you guys got about the game? Like, how did you feel like the Sailor Moon fan base or even just like the people who were coming into collectible games from this new wave of Pokemon really thought about it? Yeah, I, I think it was super popular and people love opening up packs and then seeing what's inside. I mean, that was in some ways the, at the height of the CCG market where people were just excited about opening things up. And and that was was before the factory sets, before people kind of ex had higher expectations. And so the excitement was certainly there, but I think uh, that the game, well, you know, my industry compatriots uh, thought is like, oh, congratulations, you know, getting the Origins Award and designed a, a, you know, a game that was very accessible. It, it was almost like, 
like the redheaded stepchild because it wasn't a real CCG. It didn't fall into line with what everything else was. And so I think it was kind of poo pooed a little bit because uh, it wasn't a real game, which which I'm not disagreeing with any of them because they were right. It, it really didn't fall into that that system that was set up for CCG. So I don't think it was ever really treated seriously. And of course, the license, uh, you know, unless you're a fan of the show, it's easy to, to make fun of, you know, a, a mid 20 year old guy playing with a, you know, a girl's young girl's kid show. Uh, you know, it's something that I got used to with this, the role playing game. And we definitely saw a lot of it come through with the collectible card game as well. Well, with cultures that we've seen since, like bronies and stuff like that, I think you were well ahead of your time with that. <laughs> I, yeah, I think that um, it actually, I actually have a magazine here, Inquest magazine. They um, they reviewed it in there, and they actually gave it. It was there was a bit of a wave, a glut again after Pokemon came out of collectible card games, and they called it the best game of the summer if you were willing to try it. No, oh, yeah, it, that and that review was was critical because the Inquest was like the magazine back then for them for the card games, and to have them step up and give it a shot where a lot of other people might not give it that, I think that was a, a huge factor that we had in there. And so, yeah, really happy with, with the reception that we got from from the professional magazine of the time. That's fantastic. And you mentioned it very briefly, but what was it like being nominated for an Origin Award way back when Bessem first came out? to actually winning one for a game that you had just, like in an entire genre, you had just fallen into once again. Yeah, I mean, that was amazing. Obviously, with the uh, Bessem role-playing game, I got nominated for the Origins Award. And so I stepped up and I was actually on the committee that did the nominations at the time, the Origins Committee. And so I was kind of an insider didn't give me an advantage or anything, but I, I was working on the committee and putting together the ceremony. And so getting nominated, I think a lot of that had to do with making sure that, yeah, I, I knew enough to make, to get all the copies out into the hands of the, the jury. That was something you're encouraged to do. And if you didn't get your games into the hands of the jury, then the chance of getting nominated was a lot less, but it was an interesting year that it was the year we switched over where we ended up Prior to this, the Origins Award were always a more of a jury. Uh, so it's only the people from uh, your peers that ended up voting on this. But that was the year we actually split it up and we included a popular vote as well from the fans. And it was this combined vote. And I believe, uh, I, and I don't know for sure, but from the the birds that I hear twerting, uh, uh, tweeting about it, that I the, the Salem and Collective Carney did not win if it was just the jury. It was a, they chose a different game, but when they brought in the fan base and they combined the votes, that's what pushed that, that game over the top. So it was, it was really something I certainly didn't expect that I was in a crowd with some fantastic games at the time and get to hear my name called out uh, for that was, was an amazing moment. It wasn't the only origins where we ended up winning uh, you know, in our time, but it was one of the sweetest because it was the, the game design, not graphic design, not as novels that we ended up getting awards for, but it was specifically getting nominated for that game design for something that I, I did not know collectible card games. And I thought that was what made me feel really good at the time. That's an amazing story. Like, like I said, so far, your story is just, again, another <laughs> crit, 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 pure 20, just a natural 20. Fantastic. <laughs> Um, so let's just quickly move through here. Um, the game had a second expansion, Past and Future. Uh, did you design that? I did. Yeah, that was that was more on me than the previous one. Obviously, it was somewhat uh, while I was the lead designer, it was somewhat of a, of a combined effort for the first one. But the past and future, I knew it had to have a follow up. And so I designed that almost that one in solo to add, get, add in a couple extra new elements, as well as you know, the more of the series, of course, because, you know, the Sailor Moon series was was fairly big at the time. And um that was the final expansion of the game. And like you said, it had been received well in market. Maybe the production side, it was a little expensive. It had been critically well received. Why was that the final set? Uh, I think it, it came down to the cost versus the benefit. So while it sold well, the cost was so high to produce a game like that. It wasn't high enough. And Dart Flip Cards was not, they, they were not a collectible card game company. All they did was do trading cards. They did uh, stuff like uh, like sports cards. Uh, they did Crocodile Dundee card or Crocodile Hunter cards. And then they, they did this card game, which was completely new to them. And so they always went to the card game market and now they had this new thing and they didn't know what to do with it. And I didn't know what to do with it. And the costs were out of whack. So it just made sense to, to focus on on, you know, kind of in and out, you kind of have your have your moment and then you, you leave on a high rather than than taking more of a financial risk that was necessary. Well, I have so many questions, but we are running up close on time. So what I want to do is I just want to quickly ask, unfortunately, the, the game might, this might not have been your decision, but the game 
came out and it didn't have any support for things that were so common in collectible games at the time, like organized play or anything like that. Was that ever discussed with dart flick cards or anything like that? Uh, absolutely. When Whenever we got together to make this, I said, I can create the Zillion game, but I don't know anything about this organized play market. And every of the, one of these games, the big games all have it. And they said, well, we're just not going to have it because no one had the expertise. No one had the knowledge base. And that was one of the, the things going against it. If we were decipher or we were an actual card game company at the time, I think we could have turned this into something remarkable uh, in terms of a massive sales force. But yeah, there was no organized play. There was no competition. It was this thing that was out on its own that critically was received well enough and you know, was good enough to win an Origins Award, but wasn't good enough to have that support because no one knew anything about uh, doing that. Yeah, that was, so that was a business thing more than anything else. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a shame to hear because as I do more and more of these shows with different creators and stuff like that, there is always those factors. Like very rarely have I heard that like the public wasn't interested. Like it's always been like a, a you know, there was just the business decisions didn't go right. Somebody like the collectible card games are such in its infancy then. So many companies were getting involved who didn't know what they were doing. So there was over costs and, um, and, you know, overhead that was so unexpected. The games couldn't really pay for themselves unless they were a smash hit like Magic or a Decipher game, like you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly it. It was, it was a glut and, and it was a real problem at the time. There were so many card games coming out and not all of them were well designed and not all of them were properly supported. And in the end, the, the good ones are going to survive. You might get a couple that, that strike gold and get lucky, but it was the companies that, were, that made the game successful, not the games, uh, I think, other than, you know, Magic was it probably had a lot to do with the game. But uh, after the, the kind of the first one, it was a lot about the companies and the success that they had. Right, right. Obviously, licensing and stuff like that as well all plays into it. So my, I, I would love to spend another hour on this. Like, I would love to actually explore your story. I am really inspired by everything you've said so far. And obviously, you know, at some point you stop rolling the 20s. Um, but we might have to skip over that. And like, let's jump forward a couple of years to uh, the, like the mid last decade. And you revisited the Sailor Moon property again. Tell me about how that came about. Yeah, so after uh, the company I was with, Guardians of Order, we ended up shutting down because the company wasn't viable at the time. And that was in the mid 2000s. And so I had left the industry to go and pursue other uh, avenues, but I was still a gamer. And so while you know the industry was something I wasn't interested in participating in, I still wanted to play. And at that point, it was board games were, were really on the up and up. And the D20 glut and the role playing was kind of dropping a little bit. White Wolf, one of the big players, they were on the exit uh, out as a as a dominant force in role playing and so i got into a lot of board games and i you know that designer aspect of it is like oh i, I want to publish a game and you know i haven't really done board games before but i want to get in and start doing board games so i decided to, to make a new company and start coming out with a couple of small board game designs and then of course once i'm going to do that then this pull towards sailor moon was a very natural i knew about licensing i had done a lot of that and i thought well i mean i have a decent pedigree with sailor moon i don't think there's a single person on the planet that knows Sailor Moon games better than I do and has worked with more Sailor Moon games than I had. So I contacted uh, up Toei Animation, which is the, the head company from Japan. They have a US arm. And I said, hey, you know, I could send you everything I've done for Sailor Moon in the gaming field. I would very much like to do a Sailor Moon game. And I know you have a new series coming out. You're rebooting Sailor Moon and Sailor Moon Crystal. Why don't you work with me and allow me to license it and I can get it up and running as a tabletop game system when tabletops are huge. And so, yeah, even though I was a nobody, you know, starting up another new company, uh, another kind of solo enterprise but I, that, by that point I had the pedigree in the past and they knew what I had done in the past and I could show them everything and so they took a chance on me even though there was other companies interested in dueling Sailor Moon they decided to work with me because of the experience that I had and so that's how it opened up for doing uh, table cop games for Sailor Moon Crystal. That's right and I encourage everyone to check those out that Sailor Moon dice game and um, there's another one as well what was the other one? Yeah, so the other one that that is currently out, so that's called Truth or Bluff, which is uh, kind of kind of like a, a bit of a, a bluffing style game where you're just passing cards. Very very simple. These aren't high strategy games. These are intended to be light. And the the Sailor Moon game, the dice game, is based on the Sailor Moon Button Men that I had published back in 2000 with Cheap Ass Games. So we kind of redid that in in a slightly different format, but it's a reissue of a, a very simple dice game. And then we have a third one that is at the press right now and should be out probably early 2022. And that is a, a game by Richard Garfield, who actually designed Magic the Gathering. And so this is a, based on Hive Mind, which is a game that currently 
Calliope Games publishes based on, uh, and we base it on that we licensed the hive mind rules for Salem and Crystal Universe. That's fantastic. I can't wait to see that. I actually didn't know that was in the works. And, and you know, obviously Richard's name is quite sacred on a podcast like <laughs> this. Um, so I'm going to jump to what we have is community questions. So there is a couple of questions that I got from audiences of the show. And <laughs> I just want to ask some of those. So just jumping from where we were speaking just then, um, with your, we didn't really get into it, but with your recent success on Kickstarter and stuff like that, and your access to the Sailor Moon license, would you be interested in revisiting a card game, maybe what they call a living card game or expandable card game for Sailor Moon ever again? And that question comes from Daniel Voigt. Yeah, so it's the, the problem with, with Sailor Moon is it's a very difficult license. Like the, the fact that the, we've had the license for, for you know, four or five years now, and we've only managed to get two games out and we have a third game at press. It's a very long approval process. And so that's the problem with working with Sailor Moon in general uh, with that license. But a bigger picture issue is be, being a small company and being primarily role-playing game focused, we haven't exhausted our avenues on role playing and we're still very much into that field so i kind of want to do a little bit more playing in that and you know in the end we only have so many resources to go around so we're going to be focusing on doing role playing for a little bit longer fantastic well uh, and any more sailor moon maybe yeah well th this is the the last one that we have planned the the richard garfield one is the last game that we have planned in that line and that will that will give us a three tabletop game set we're not saying it'll never have anything else but uh this is the last one we have planned oh sorry i meant specifically for role playing Oh, for role playing. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So we we don't have the Sailor Moon role playing game license. It was it was specific for tabletop games. Role playing is a very very different field. And as I mentioned earlier, it's actually a different company. So Kodansha is the one that has the book licensing. And so it's it's a little convoluted compared to what they do in in North America. The Japanese licenses are very very different. Okay, fantastic. So I have another question here from Derek Claren. Now, um, as the designer of the game. Just a real quick, simple question. Do you have in your mind when you were designing it the ideal number of scouts you would put in a deck or knights? Yeah, you, you mean, typically when you're playing a game, you want to have one max two. You don't want to have a whole set. And the reason why is because you're going to be powering up and you're going to have a, your, your level one and then your level two, level three, level four. Well, if you have too many different scouts, you're going to go broad and not deep. And there's no sense having a level three Sailor Mars card when you haven't even got the level one Mars out. You have Mercury level one and Tuxedo Mask level one, but you don't have Mars out. And because of that, you want to focus down to one or two is what I would say. Probably two. So you can do team ups. If you just have one, you can't do combined powers. But if you have two strong ones, that's the better way to go. There you go. Some strategy from the horse's mouth themselves there you go fantastic so uh jason white asks um did you have any plans to do a set for the following seasons like the outer guardians or anything like that yeah we we didn't because at the time the the deke license was only uh the sailor moon season one and sailor moon r they didn't have s and supers and, and stars out there so it was never part of our plan because we didn't have the rights to do that we only had the first two seasons because that's all that was available in, in english at the time mm -hmm. so um the next question I have is Ben Strauss. He asks, um, did Deke or Toei have any uh, say on the final product? And I'm just going to add to that as well. How did you guys capture the images for the cards? So most of the, the card images, a lot of them were screen caps and we had a, a great screen captioning program, but we also ended up getting a lot of uh, small cells in from uh, Japan, which we could scan in and use it for there. So these are copies of cells that they'd give out to licensors. And so that was our primary method of, of getting that information. But in terms of, of Toei, at the time, going way back in that, that time, licensing was typically handled by a master licensor in the US for almost all anime properties. So as I mentioned, ED Vision, Pioneer, which is a, a Japanese company, but they had the U.S. department, Genion, uh, Inoki Films. So the, these, at the time, that's how licensing was done with anime because it wasn't really imported over here. Now, there are so many companies that are localized and they're working much more heavily with the, the original Japanese company. So we didn't interact with Toei at the time. All we were doing is interacting with Deke. And Deke, as an English master license holder, was was fairly lax on the approval process. We're finding now that when you're dealing with directly with the Japanese companies, they care a lot more about precision with their licensing. Wow, that's amazing. So even if the game had been successful, you would have to edge out more cards from that same, you know, season one and two run that Deke did. That, that's right, because there wasn't anything else we can do. Those are the only two seasons that we had access to. And so we kind of feel, felt like we exhausted everything. So there was nothing more to keep the line going, even if we wanted to. That's amazing. So it's almost like one of those TV series where it's like, you know, almost like the British ones where it's two seasons, it's done, but it's a classic that will live forever. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I know that the game's very difficult to find. Every so often it'll pop up on eBay, but uh, there's a there, the print runs weren't so huge that it was a glut in the market. So if you can find a copy of the Sailor Moon CCG, yeah, pick it up because it's not that common. Uh, if you're just a casual CCG fan, I recommend putting it in your collection. It is even the simple version is too super fun. You know, just rock, paper, scissors mm -hmm. all the time. So let's go out on the closing game of this show. So what you get to do is you get to choose a, game, a, a booster pack for Kraken questions. Release the Kraken. So Kraken questions, you choose a booster pack color. I will crack it open. There'll be three silly questions that'll be completely unrelated to anything, maybe suggested by a listener, and a serious game design question. What color would you like to try? Uh, let's go with the pinky red. Yeah, let's go red. There you go. Appropriate pinky red to say Lamar's, right? Exactly. So we've got red. Let's see what we end up with today. So your first common silly question is, other than your hometown, what is your favorite city? Shinjuku, no doubt about it. My one trip that I made to Japan back in the early 2000s, Shinjuku as a, as a part of Tokyo just blew me away. There was no other city like it in the world that, uh, that anything I've come across the internet. I haven't done a lot of travels, but it was definitely my favorite city I've ever been to. That's fantastic. Okay, so uh, you may or may not have an answer to this. As you discussed, you're not a collectible card game player, but if you have any perspective on it, do you have any thoughts on Magic the Gathering's Commander format? Uh, so I did run a, a cafe, uh, and so I, while I didn't play the game, I know about the Commander format. Very, very popular. Uh, it was something that worked really well in the cafe setting. I'd say from a business model, it's great but I don't have any opinions on, on a playing model, unfortunately. <laughs> well, it's incredibly popular nowadays. And I think it's actually probably the most popular way to play Magic nowadays because it's made it more like a community board game. Sort of like the social aspect that you had built into the Sailor Moon game, which wasn't just two players. Just want to remind everyone, you could play as many players as you wanted. That That's true. It's something that, that's really talked about. It was an oppositional. You can have a huge group of people playing it. And that was part of those connections that we wanted to make sure people could make. That's fantastic. All right, so last common question. Would you rather visit Jurassic Park or Westworld? <laughs> I think Jurassic Park, I mean, dinosaurs. Oh my gosh, I love dinosaurs. And the science in me, uh, you know, as a, as a chemist and having spent all that time, far better than Westworld. I think Westworld is far deadlier than, than Jurassic Park. So yeah, the science geek in me wants to go there. As long as they keep those electric fences on. Yes, oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you only have one game to draw from, but in your experience, this is your rare question, mm. what was the most challenging thing about designing a collectible card game? Uh, I think it was it was definitely having the numbers balance in a way that was slightly different than a role playing game. The numbers had to make sense where you have you you can't role play your context out. All you have is the raw numbers. And the real challenge was it had to be set up because we're mimicking the show. If in the show, certain characters can defeat certain villains or certain heroes, that had to work. If I shoot my attack at a, at a lowly monster and it defeats them, but I shoot it at uh, one of the, the head villains and doesn't defeat them, I, that has to be represented in the series. So it was a lot of number crunching to make sure we represented the series as perfectly as possible. And while we did the foundational work in the role-playing game, we, we had to just go on numbers in the CTG. So that was probably the most, most complex uh, design aspects. So as I mentioned before, that is called development for like big CCG companies like Magic the Gathering. And it's something they struggle with every single set. So you're not surprised that you've uh, you bumped up against that yourself. So that's fantastic. So you actually have had some amazing success uh, recently with a brand new product that's just uh, finished a Kickstarter in the last few months and will be hitting market very shortly. We didn't get a chance to talk about it, but I'm so curious because it almost harkens back to an evolved form of you know, a leveled up form of what you started all those years ago in 97 we spoke about. Tell me about what that product is. Yeah, so it's Anime 5e, which is a an anime role-playing version of Dungeons and Dragons, so fifth edition. And so what we've done is we've taken a lot of the tropes and concepts of anime as well as uh, a, a wider point-based effects-based aspect that has a lot of flexibility and grafted that into the D20 system that's used in fifth edition. So it's not quite as prescriptive as when you're, you're playing your barbarian or your mage or your fighter and you're going up in levels. This gives you a lot more flexibility based on some of the, the more wacky or, or flexible designs that you can have in a lot of different anime shows. So we have new classes and new races that are more anime focused. You can play a slime if you want to, you can play a magical girl, <laughs> you can play a cat girl. And we, 
we also have, you can play uh, 30 or 40 foot tall demons in the game as player characters. You're probably not going to be going into the inn if you're that big, but we ended up bringing in a lot of different diverse aspects. And this was because we had so much experience with the very first role playing game that I designed as, as big as small mouth. So we had so much experience with bringing in a, a point based flexible mechanic that merging that into fifth edition just made sense for us. And it was very well received on Kickstarter. So we're really looking forward to getting that out. It's at the pr press now. PDFs are available for all the backers and uh, we have the books on press and they'll be out by the end of the year. Do you guys have any content that you have that teaches people how to play or how to build characters or anything like that? Uh, it's it's not an introductory game the way, you know, say like an intro box set for D&D &D would be. It doesn't involve, it's not super complex, but if you've never role playing before, it'd be very difficult to understand how to jump in and do it. But the coming out, we do have a quick start kind of rule system that is, you know, a 16 page book, and that'll be available for the public shortly. We're going to be uploading all the PDFs onto drive through RPG. That'll probably be coming out in the fall. We wanted to give kind of exclusive access to the, the PDF backers on our Kickstarter first, but that'll be widely available uh, in the fall coming out. And yeah, we do offer a, a free book that people can get, get a kind of get a feel for it. But most people know how to play Dungeons and Dragons. Most people know characters, so you know, how to create characters fifth edition. And you know, we do highlight the changes, but it's it's based on a very, very common and well designed and well understood role-playing game system out there already. That's fantastic. So Everybody check the links in the description of this episode, whether you're on YouTube or whether you're listening to an audio, the description will have links to Anime 5e, even some other stuff we didn't get to talk about, like behind you there, the best and fourth edition. Uh, check it out. Mark's work is absolutely phenomenal and, and has a huge following at the moment, bigger than ever. I just want to say thank you very much for joining me today, Mark, on the Booster Pack. It has been an absolute pleasure. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from you, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Rand. Really appreciate being here and uh, meeting all your fans. All right, that's it from me. Thanks so much for joining us. And this has been the Booster Pack. Remember, until next time, keep shuffling. And there you have it. Our episode all about the Sailor Moon collectible card game. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to Mark for telling those amazing stories. Now, if you want to check out any of Mark's current projects or those Sailor Moon tabletop games we spoke about, check the links in the description. You will find not only Bessem 4th Edition, but also Anime 5e, the runaway Kickstarter smash hit that did over 6,000% of its original Kickstarter goal. That is rarefied air. So if you want to get into that sort of role playing, check that out. Or if you're a beginner, maybe look into D&D 5th edition first and then jump into that. Because I feel like it is going to be a mainstay moving forward for hobby role playing in that genre. Now... Finally, if you want to reach out to me, you can find me on social media, whether that is via Facebook on the CCG History Facebook page, or even via my preferred medium on Twitter, which is at CCG History. Or if you don't even happen to have either of those, no stress, you can reach me on the brand new email we've set up linked in the description below. That is the booster pack at CCG History. Let me know any feedback on any of those channels. Let me know any games you want to hear about on any of those channels. And finally, let me know if you have any suggestions for cracking questions, whether it's a silly question that you would be entertained just to hear answered, or if it was a serious game design question, let us know. We'll put it in a booster pack, wrap it up, and then give you the credit when eventually it comes out from a guest selection. Now, the last thing I want to mention today is thank you so much for joining me, but especially thank you to Cal Arness, I think I'm saying that right, who suggested this episode topic. I remembered this game from when I was a kid and I wanted to explore it deep. So if you have a suggestion for an episode, again, let me know via either the email or the social media I just mentioned. And until next time, I appreciate you joining us, but I will repeat myself as I always do. Keep shuffling. <laughs>